what we're going to be talking about here is how to influence behavior. Uh, obviously, you need to be able to measure how you're doing, but the people that we're going to be having here on stage with us today are really some of the best. Uh, we're going to be having Anna Hussein, Shira Ebel, Nir Eyal, and Josh Lee. Why don't you guys come on out? Let's start with uh, introductions. Uh, let's start with Nir. So Nir, uh, many of you guys are probably familiar with Nir's book, Hooked. Uh, Hooked was uh, in, what, it debuted on the Wall Street Journal's business bestseller list. And uh, a lot of what we write about is the intersection of technology, psychology, uh, and I think that you're a perfect fit for today's, today's panel. Thank you, Shira. <laughs> on that note, we'll move on to Shira. So, uh, so really excited to have Shira with us. Uh, Shira is the CEO of Hunter and Bard. Uh, it's a creative uh, marketing strategy agency, but you've also mentored uh, at Google, Microsoft, and Seedcamp. And in addition to being an expert marketer, uh, you're also the creator and editor of the SaaS Insider podcast. Next, we have Josh Liu. Josh is the director of product for Zynga's central product management team, which is the growth team at Zynga. And uh, that team is responsible for reach, retention, and monetization experimentation across all of Zynga's 20 plus games. And prior to that, Josh was an early PM at Playton, which was sold to Disney. And then finally, we have Anna Hussein. Anna is a senior growth marketer at HubSpot. She's led content strategy and has managed an incredible group of growth marketers who spend every day developing and experimenting with content. Uh, she's also co-authored Twitter for Dummies and was named Beta Boston's 25 Under 25. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention here, because I think it's pretty interesting, is two of you really come from really strong B2C backgrounds and two of you come from strong B2B backgrounds. So some of the things I'd like to touch upon in today's panel is, you know, whether customer engagement is the same across B2C and B2B or if it differs and so how and why you feel the way you do. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, what, do we, what do we mean when we say customer engagement? Uh, you know, I mean, is, is engagement just somebody who reads an article and, it, you know, they spend a couple minutes reading or is it more than that? You know, we heard today uh, Ada from LinkedIn talking about engaging users through email or through in-app prompts. Um, Josh, why don't we go ahead and start with you. What, what is customer engagement? Sure. Uh, so, customer engagement for us is anytime someone interacts with our game, but not all engagement is created equal you know, for us. Um, so, you know, there, there are all these tactics you can get uh, people to come in and engage with your game, um, but for us, what we're looking for is really, really deep engagement. Um, and that deep engagement can be with the core loop of the game, and you know, we design our games um, you know, to, to keep people in them and to progress and do all these you know, wonderful, fun things in the games, but we also have a social loop in our games, and so that's you know, really where we find the best engagement is when people are engaging with each other and doing and a question about that, is engagement like a habit? Are you guys trying to build habits with some of your games? Uh, yeah, absolutely. But um, you know, when we talk about habits, we're really talking about um, you know, giving people a sense of achievement uh, for playing our games, giving them a sense of progression uh, and investment. Uh, and you know, that's, I think, where the habits are developed is you know, we want people to come back because they're having fun, we're driving value, and, and, and you know, you know, driving tons of fun uh, to, our, to our players. Got it. So Nir, uh, any, any thoughts on what Josh shared? Yeah, so I, you know, I think uh, when it comes to, I'm not sure if my mic is working, is mic working? Yeah? yeah? Okay. I think when it comes to engagement, I think uh, what we're all terrified of in building our products is that we nail growth, but without engagement, we become a leaky bucket business. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do to grow your business, I mean, we don't really care about just new users, we care about total users. And so without engagement, without retaining our users, uh, and continually providing the users that we spent all this time and effort growth hacking our way into, if we can't hold on to them, we've got nothing. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many companies I've seen kind of come and go. I mean, Silicon Valley graveyards are littered with these companies that figured out some amazing viral strategy and then, you know, they lose all their users because people don't keep coming back. Right, so I think it's safe to say that engagement happens at every stage of the funnel. It's not just something that you use to acquire users, although you can certainly engage users through content marketing email, but uh, like sure, I know that you have some thoughts on that about the, how important it is to engage users at every single step of the funnel and customer journey and lifecycle. So engagement is mindshare, 
And if you're not in front of mind, if you're not in your customer's mind, if you have no mind share, you're not there, you don't exist. So you're there at the top of the funnel. They have to read your blog or, or get your thought leadership. I obviously focus more on the B2B side. And then as they go through and they start using your product, well, they have to actually use your product. So Salesforce figured out that a lot of their companies weren't actually actively using the product to the optimum capacity. And they started putting in customer success metrics internally to be able to figure out who's using it, who isn't, and to reach out to those who aren't using it properly in order to fix that. Because if you're not using it optimally, okay, if you're not using the product as it should, your churn rate's gonna go up eventually. They're gonna end up figuring out, are they spending their money wisely or not? And if they're not spending their wi money wisely, they're gonna go. So customer engagement has to be all the way through the funnel to the point of retention and keeping them forever and keeping them engaged. If they're not engaged, they're not gonna stay with the product. So, Adam, I'd love to hear, yeah, I'd love to hear what Thank you you're say from the yeah. 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 Um, so I think what, it's easier to ask what engagement isn't because engagement can be so many different things. And one thing that I think you can really easily get caught up on is engagement metrics that don't actually matter. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen the new movie that's out with Anne Hathaway called The Intern, but there's a scene where they ring a bell because they've just hit like X thousand Instagram followers and the whole like startup room goes crazy and it's like the big hot thing, everyone's super happy. Uh, and I hear, sim obviously it's not that extreme, but I hear similar things often where it's like, oh, well, you know, X people were on this screen within the product, or X people liked this post, without actually looking at if that engagement metric is a metric that matters to your business. One example I'll give is a really simple example, which is comments on a blog. So just because you're getting comments doesn't mean that you created an engaging post. One thing that we did um, at HubSpot, created the Sidekick blog for anyone who uh, used Sidekick, and I didn't really care about comments. I was like, okay, people think that comments mean that you have engaged in content, but I don't really care about that. But then I did start caring about it because people started commenting on our blog about our product. So they were relating the stories and the messages we were putting in our blog content back to our product. And that actually gave us, the PMs and everyone on our team, an opportunity to respond to those comments and have an actually beneficial discussion about how people were using our product. So in that way, comments then became an authentic engagement metric for us, but like standalone, they wouldn't. So I guess the takeaway is like to really think about what engagement metrics actually matter and which ones are just sort of there to make you feel better. So uh, just go ahead. Sure. Vanity metrics. Yeah, then the dreaded vanity metrics. So uh, you know, what I'd love to actually hear as well is, you know, is there a framework that you guys follow when you're trying to figure out, you know, where do you want to engage users and what's the right message to send the user at the right time? You know, maybe talk about the processes, and I'd like to ask each one of you because I think you're all going to have really unique perspectives on it. Uh, Josh, we'll go ahead and start with you. Sure. So um, the way we think about engagement, um, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, gold benchmark at Zynga. We design, you know, our products to, um, you know, so all of our products are, are mobile products at this point. We design each of them to take advantage of, you know, when people want to interact with our products. So with a game like Words with Friends. You know, we tend to see engagement that you know, happens to be peppered throughout the day. We've got you know, a dozen or more sessions per day. Each of the sessions are very, very short. Uh, and we tailor the game design to make sure that we can sort of capture that kind of engagement. Um, you know, for another you know, kind of game, maybe like Empire's Knowledge, which is a sort of more hardcore game, you know, those, those sessions are a lot longer. Maybe there are a few of them, uh, fewer of them throughout the day. And the game design reflects that. Um, as far as you know, frameworks go, we, we measure engagement. It's sort of the the key thing that we measure. And so if you look at, if you go to our, you know, if you ever get the chance to look at our stats portal, our internal stats dashboard, you'll see on the left panel the things that we care the most about. So reach, revenue, retention, and then immediately, you know, thereafter are key game actions, which is our engagement uh, measures, uh, and then experimentation. And so it's something that all of our PMs are trained um, to look at all of the time. Uh, and that's the lens that we view, you know, all of our experiments through, our feature sets, everything. And uh, Nir, how about for you? Is there kind of a framework that you follow? I mean, obviously, in your writings, uh, you talk about the hooked model. You know, you can talk a bit about that for people that may not have. Uh, yeah, so I'm a little bit partial to hooked model. I, I like that model. Um, it's a four-step process: trigger, action, reward, investment. Uh, there's more about it. You know, I spent several years writing this book about it. Uh, about how companies like Zynga, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, Slack, all these companies have embedded in them this this hook model, whether they designed it. Uh, like was the case in product time too. Uh, Ryan Hoover was, was uh, worked together on the book, so that's a product that has the book kind of built from the ground up into it, 
or if it's by happenstance and companies didn't realize they were building hooks into their products, but it turned out they, they had them. Uh, the, this is that fundamental pattern of a trigger, an action, a reward investment uh, that I think is a really cheap and advantageous way for, for, for people who rely upon habits. And to be clear, you know, not every business model needs a habit, right? Lots of businesses can bring people back with, with other methods. You can use advertising, search engine optimization, lo lots of ways to bring cu customers back. But if you rely on habits, then you've got to have a hook. And I think probably the most frequent mistake I see in companies trying to build consumer habits is that they don't think about the internal triggers enough. We all think about the external triggers, right? When am I going to send this notification? Or what does this email look like? We only think about the external triggers, and we optimize the hell out of these external triggers. But when it comes to the internal triggers, right? What's the customer's itch? What's the pain point? What's the psychological need that my customer has that prompts them to want to use this product on their own? I mean, think about the tremendous power that we have when somebody has associated your product with a daily routine. And we're literally that's talking about brain chemistry, right? I mean, uh, to, to some degree, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so I think that's the crucial part is figuring out what's the internal trigger, and then, you know, instead of just bombarding people with messages on your schedule, on the app maker's schedule, you've got to figure out how to closely couple the internal trigger with the external trigger. That's when our messages feel like magic. Is when they are delivered at exactly the right time. Got it. And Adam, I know that you worked on, I think it was a Sidekick product, is that right? So did you guys use a framework when you were you know, kind of going out with version 1.0 of creating, what are those customer engagement points? Maybe you can talk a bit about that. So uh, I don't necessarily have an engagement process, but there are a couple interesting things that we did. One was that we placed a huge, we talked a lot about data, which is great, we used a lot of data uh, within our systems, but one thing that we spent a lot of time on was a lot of qualitative research as well, and one thing that I thought was interesting at one point that we did was before we went out and we did our persona research, we used uh, engagement cohorts to decide which trends we were going to pull from the user interviews we did. So what I did was I looked through all of our sidekick users, and there were some easy buckets of engagement, aka churned users, paid users. But then I went through and bucketed. I sort of looked at usage patterns of how actively someone was using sidekick, and then broke those into, OK, this is an active user, this is a super active user based on how many notifications they were getting out of the product, and use that those to set up these engagement cohorts that we use to then bucket out all the different groups of people we want to interview. So that way we can see, okay, what are the trends in the user interviews we're getting across people who are super active users, who are just somewhat users, people who, uh, we had one bucket of engagement called drive-by users, people who would go through our entire onboarding process, activate, and then peace out the next day, and it's like, whoa, what happened there? Uh, so we had to use engagement to set up what those cohorts would be and then do a lot of end user interviews and see what the patterns were across these different uh, cohorts. And sure, how about when you engage with some of your clients? Uh, you know, how, how do you kind of get, get started? How do you get them to sort of think about it, uh, making sure that you know, all the messages are relevant and you know, that they are literally engaging with those users and turning them into customers? So for us, it's watching the funnel. Um, it's just making sure, well, first of all, that everything's actually properly set up. Um, that email marketing is optimized and that the content marketing is on point, um, that there's a funnel in from the content marketing. So if we are a HubSpot agency, if you've got a blog post, you have a call to action at the bottom of your blog post, you'd think that this would be something really obvious that most people would have and that most companies would have, but it's amazing how many B2B companies don't actually have that. You don't have a button at the bottom of taking them to a landing page. If somebody is actually going down and reading everything down at the bottom of the page, capture that person, you know, get that lead, that potential lead. So taking them over, watching the numbers, uh, how many people are reading this particular blog post and are they going over? Which are the ones that are working better than others? Go create more of that content. So it's all just looking at what's working and what isn't and taking the funnel and paring it down and doing the email marketing to the length that it needs to be. It's not just sending one email, you're typically sending seven or eight to 12. So it's all of that and seeing how the engagement goes, who dries off, who doesn't, and then watch the personas and see who stays and who doesn't. And, and I think I recall that you mentioned to me that you were pr pretty blown away at how many of your clients actually think about appealing to themselves when they're you know, creating some of this content as opposed to actually thinking about the personas and the yeah. actual users who they're trying to engage in. So that's action. another thing. Don't write about your own company. Uh, just don't write about you, write about your industry, write about helpful information that's for the people. You, it's, it, I, I keep saying it over and over again, and it never ceases to amaze me how many companies don't. It's hard when you're actually in it 
to actually do that because you think that your company is the most interesting thing around, but then you need to take yourself out of that position and put yourself as a reader. And when you're reading other companies' blogs, um, you know, is the stuff that they're doing, like Intercom is great. They just do stuff about the industry. Um, Heaton was amazing with the uh, KISS metrics. Neil Patel handled that beautifully. Everything was 90% of their blog posts were about industry posts that was helpful information that pulled people in and brought people back. And, um, and they captured an industry from it. Great. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, people that we think are doing you know, customer engagement really well and really poorly. Uh, Josh, why don't we go ahead and start with you. For the really poorly, uh, we'll stay away from names unless uh, you want to mention your own company. Sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah. I, I can start with poorly and then we can get to the good. Um, so I'll, I'll call out Zynga. Um, you know, push notifications on mobile uh, are, um, you know, it's an incredibly powerful channel. And shame on us if, you know, we're not good stewards of that channel. In the past, it's been really, really easy to use push notifications as sort of a quick hit, shot in the arm for engagement um, because of the power and the leverage of that channel. Um, you know, we're sort of you know, realizing you know, in the last couple months, well, last year or so, um, that you know, we have to be really good stewards of that channel because it's a channel that um, has stayed strong and if you use it correctly, um, remains strong. Um, so for us, um, you know, it's, it's a learning process of you know, measuring first the downstream metrics to make sure that you are being good stewards of the channel. So it's everything from uninstall rates to um, to uh, disablement rates for push notifications, but even your click-through rates on an individual campaign are useful to track uh, when it comes to efficacy of your campaigns. Um, and then a process of sort of lots of experimentation um, and, and lots of optimization to, to get that right over time. Great, and Adam, any people you think are doing a great job with customer engagement and then those that uh, might be doing poorly? So I was actually gonna call myself out too. So um, there was a point with the society that sort of operated its own startup within HubSpot. We kind of had our own space, our own team, all that sort of stuff. And so because we were this like little startup, we didn't really have people focused on specific roles. So you know, I came in as the first marketer and started setting up email marketing workflows. And once we had our first customer support person, they were setting up customer support workflows. And people just kept being added to the team or taking ownership of areas. We never actually had ownership of email until one day we realized uh, we were on all these spam reports. And it's because we kept adding more people who were adding in their own workflows that we all of a sudden had like 10 different workflows going, going to all these different people. And a given user could get like dozens of emails from just sidekick their first week of signing up and it was just driving people crazy. So we kind of effed up engagement at that point. We had to do a really long and thorough, um, it was like a full day workshop where me and Dan Walshnox, who came on our team, had to go through literally every single email that goes out of our system and dissect which ones were working, which ones weren't, which ones had high unsubscribe rates, which some of them, uh, some of, I can't even like share what, <laughs> what the unsubscribe rate was for some of them because everyone would probably be shamed. Um, but there were some that were really bad and we just weren't watching it because we were so focused on just hustling and GSD and going, going, going that we didn't really set up enough mechanisms to monitor um, how our emails were doing. So then we, you know, we put in some processes to make sure that we could actually see, you know, if there was an unusual amount of emails sent out per day that we would be alerted of that and make sure that everything was sort of, uh, sort of working well. And sure, are you going to uh, call yourself out as well here? <laughs> I am, actually. Okay, it's, I have an agency, so it's a matter of the cobbler has no shoes. Um, so <laughs> even though we do inbound marketing, we do design and branding, uh, we don't actually get to practice as much as we like because we're too busy working on client work. So, um, you know, we have had, we've done newsletters of maybe, uh, we, don't, we did like one month where we were good at it. And then the rest of the time, we just get too busy on client work, and it just doesn't end up getting sent out. But if you don't have to, I know the power of it. I know how much it means to be able to send it out, and I know that it brings in work. Um, but on the other hand, when everybody's busy working on work, getting the focus to go back to building the agency work is a, is a whole other thing. So just getting distracted. So would you guys agree that it's good to take risks, You know, try to push the envelope when you're trying to engage with customers and figure out what's working and what's not? Or you know, are you really in jeopardy of you know, losing people for life if you just go too far? So test three times. Okay, Nir, any thoughts? Uh, you know, I, I think the, the problem that I see happening is, is not about crazy ideas or too off, you know, too off the mark ideas. I think it's, um, 
what, what, what we tend to build, and we all probably go back to our organizations, and we have this backlog of 100 different things we wish we could do, but there's not much discipline about why we should do this before this before this. It's, oh, that loud customer said we should do it, or the investor says we should do it, or the highest paid person in the room says we should do it. Um, and sometimes things are super easy to test, right? We can test copy variants, you know, why not just give it a shot? But you know, some of these things are fundamentally uh, very, very heavy uh, projects. And so for that, I, I think that we need a better framework than just uh, you know, the, the, some, some loud customers think this is a good idea. So that's why I turned to consumer psychology, not just the principles around the hook model, but consumer psychology in general to help us understand what we should prioritize. Yeah, and I think that's a great point that you know, really this is an element of product design, you know, whether it's a software product that you're designing, a hardware product that you're designing. Uh, I think that a lot of these uh, engagement prompts are literally designed and built into the product, at least those that are succeeding. Right. Too often. So in the last couple minutes we have before we move to Q&A, is there, you know, like maybe we'll just give ourselves 30 seconds. Is there one point you'd like the audience to leave with today about customer engagement? If not, that's okay, but if there is. Um, that, that it's not by mistake, right? That we, we think that many of these products that we find ourselves hooked to, uh, they got lucky, right? They just stumbled on a great product design and, and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, for those of you who have worked in those companies or know people who work in those companies, I mean, these products are engineered. They spend, they spend a ton of time figuring out how to get us to keep coming back. Great. Shira? Back to the test three times. So when you're testing out something, if you test it the first time and it doesn't end up working, try it a different way, test again. And if that doesn't end up working, try it again a different way. So, so let's say you're doing an event, and one event doesn't end up working properly. Look and analyze. What about it didn't end up working? Did you not go after the right audience? Did you do the event the wrong way? Um, and then try it again, and try things three times in three different ways to be able to figure out if something really does work or doesn't work, to figure out if it's right for you or not. Webinars, that type of thing. When you're looking at engagement, there may, something may be off, but the off may be you as opposed to the actual um, medium itself. Got it, Josh. So for us, you know, the thing that we've learned, and it sounds obvious, but uh, when you screw up an engagement and you lose somebody, the single best way that we've found of getting that somebody back is socially driven. Um, you know, it, that social proof is something that we, we talked about, I think we both have talked about here uh, all day, uh, and it's something that uh, really, really works with engagement. When you lose somebody, or when somebody is, you know, has a high propensity to churn or whatever, um, using uh, their social graph, or even a made-up social graph, like you can create a social graph for folks, uh, and leveraging that uh, is an incredibly powerful way to re-engage people. It's, it's really the only effective way. Any uh, party class for the audience? Here? I would just lean on the comment I made earlier, which is uh, finding out what the authentic engagement metrics are for your business and your product and leaning in on those versus just generic uh, or vanity metrics. Excellent. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for Q&A. So does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Can we have a couple here in front? Um, I'm kind of curious, so a lot of products will have um, like a situation where uh, the customers might not really need to use it very often, right? And so in that case, it's actually, um, you know, what can you sort of do to keep them engaged between the times that they need to, to go in and use it? So it might be like six months, for instance, or is it enough to just kind of keep them brand aware and try to re-engage them later on? I can start with this one. So um, as a content person, I'm going to say content, but I actually have proof for it. Uh, so we, um, we set up a experiment at one point where we uh, took all new, new users to Sidekick and we had half of them automatically subscribe to the blog where they would get two pieces of content a week. Uh, and we wanted to see what impact that would have on their sort of life cycle because the biggest thing we had was we were like, we need to find a way to keep people engaged from the times they're not in the product. And uh, I forget the exact numbers now, but we did see that um, there was a significantly uh, improved improvement in long-term retention for the people that we subscribed to the blog versus the people who didn't because we had some mechanism to stay engaged with them. Now, it doesn't always have to be content. We later tried another workflow that just sent them like a piece of advice on how to help improve using uh, their usage of the product once a week, and that also helped increase retention. But point is, is we just used email or content as a way to keep people engaged, and that helped, uh, helped us increase our long-term retention for our users. Uh, anyone, anyone else want to chime in on that? I would add the one with content. The other alternative is community. Right, these are both, even if your product isn't something that's used frequently, uh, then you can either bolt on content or bolt on community, and those two things can, can help drive engagement. Thank you. Let's uh, go ahead and take 
question from the front. Yeah, yeah. Mary, you mentioned um, tying external triggers to internal triggers as being a key to really unlock the kind of magic and tied directly from the core value exchange or core need that you saw. But just curious about philosophies or examples of tying external triggers to internal triggers. Yeah, so right now when we send out these external triggers, we, we we really don't know very much about why why we send them at the time at the times we do, and so what I like to see is companies that can think of creative ways uh, to use data uh, to use what, what I call the investment phase of the hook to figure out when to load the next trigger, when to send the next uh, piece of outreach or next piece of uh, uh, the next external trigger, and so there's all these data sources that we could collect if we ask for them, right? So uh, we can use calendar information. Right, so Salesforce bought uh, Tempo, is that right? Salesforce bought them? Right, I think so. Microsoft. Was it Microsoft? No, Tempo. What is it? Salesforce, right? Tempo. The calendaring app, right? So there's a lot of data in people's calendaring apps, right? Around if we know that you're busy during a certain meeting, don't bother me, right? So there, that's a great idea for when we can uh, provide external triggers. Uh, for example, I worked with a, a company that uh, was all about uh, a, a sales oriented product, a, person, a product for salespeople, and they figured out the internal trigger for their user, what they felt first thing in the morning was this uncertainty about what do I do next. That was the customer's internal, internal trigger, this uncertainty about what is the highest value thing I could do right now. So they used geolocation data and calendaring data to send them the message about how to solve that problem. Here's the highest value lead to go tackle right now based on that information. And there's all sorts of other sources of information. And now that we've got these, these smart watches that are uh, proliferating, that provides all sorts of data. And then in the coming years, to, to keep skating to where the puck is going, uh, think about all the biometric data that's available very soon, right? We'll be able to tell people's emotions. We already can, actually, based on your, your phone checking habits, we can tell what emotions you're feeling, like boredom or insecurity or loneliness. There's all these, this data that we're not really looking into that I think could be very powerful for providing better external triggers. I think we may have time for one more question. Any other questions? Gentleman here in front. I'm curious about cohorts and different age groups are millennials and you know different, different gen generation X, uh, Ys, Zs, etc. Uh, and the larger continuum around motives leading to behavior and then onto habits and subsequently culture. Whether or not you've noticed. Uh, is that uh, different cohorts would be influenced differently. Josh, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, that's a good question. Um, we, the short answer is yes. We, we, do, um, we do notice stark uh, behavior pattern differences between um, you know, generations. Um, you know, a good example of that might be um, uh, in, so, you know, in mobile games, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges is distribution. And so what we find is that you know, generally when you have a, a really big game, it starts with um, young people. Uh, and young people are the first to adopt. Uh, and so you, you know, target them in certain ways with your marketing messaging or your viral features or whatever it is. Uh, and we find that you know, over, over time, we've looked at lots of games that have grown quite large. And the pattern has always been the same, where like you know, young folks are the first adopters, and then you have sort of other generations that get bolted on um, and, and sort of drag in the experience. And you can sort of you know, change your marketing messaging over time, change your feature, feature sets over time. Um, and so that's something we've noticed in games. I don't know how, um, if, if you guys have seen anything like that. But, you know, that's sort of the most stark, stark sort of example that we see. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists. I think this, uh, hopefully everyone found it as, as good as I did. I, 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 Really enjoyed it. So let's give a round of applause to everyone.